how do you actually prepare your proposal for google summer of code the trend that i have seen is that people only want to participate in this program because at the end they don't they want to get a job my first year of college i heard about google summer of code and in my second year i applied uh, uh, for the program the application process was a little like you need to put in some efforts you first need to sort out the organizations uh, there are a lot of organizations in google summer of code you know many people want to talk but they don't deliver it because of that stage fear or public speaking skill so one major thing about uh, being a student and doing multiple things is managing time place where you will feel discouraged yeah. and demotivated is not linkedin rather it's Take a break with Init Dojo podcast episode 1. In this episode, we will talk about Google Summer of Code, open source, how you can get remote job opportunities, time management and also how you can travel for free of cost. In today's episode, we have Akshay Jaimini who has contributed to Google Summer of Code for two consecutive years, same as me. So, Akshay started off with mobile development, game development, web development until he found his interest in database. I started off with IoT, hardware, computer vision until I found my expertise in NLP. So it's going to be very fun conversation. I hope you have a good time. Let's start with Google Summer of Code itself, right? It's one hot topic when it comes to open source. And not to forget, this is the month of October where we have October Fest which is going uh, actively from 11 years if I'm not wrong or as it been yeah yeah around 11 years around 11 yeah. years i think so october again it's very special to those who are contributing to open source and um, it's pretty active month as well when you talk about open source so you can you give a brief about what has been your uh, google summer of code journey since you have been part of two consecutive years okay so as far as involvement in open source is concerned i started out way back uh, when in high school so i had this very crappy computer at my home like around 4 gigs of ram and uh, so just to actually see that if it was running or something i came across linux because i had heard that it could run on a toaster also <laughs> so i just installed linux on that system and from that like from that point onwards i got a little deeper into what are, what is open source software uh, how, how people from all over the world contributing like a come together and make something so awesome right so from that point i started out uh, with open like learning about open source software so before i actually entered into development i started with open source like it was just like a fast time for me at that time after that uh, uh, towards my the end of my 12th class i started out uh, uh, exploring in development because i was a bachelor's in computer engineering so i looked up about like i started to explore a lot of fields like web development uh, game development all because of the lockdown because i had nothing else to do apart from that so during that entire time like i was just dabbling between technologies so initially i started out with basic html css and javascript then i slowly moved towards uh, the mon stack area uh, with, where i got stuck for a little while that okay exploring that okay how backend systems are created how how like how the entire thing works and from that point i was introduced to databases like postgres was my first database that i started using and uh, after that in my first year of college i heard about google summer of code and in my second year i uh, i just uh, i applied uh, uh, for the program the application process was a little like you need to put in some efforts you first need to sort out the organizations uh, there are a lot of organizations in google summer of code you need to pick out like okay this, i want to work with this organization then you have to filter out the project that you want to work in right and so at that time my decision was mostly based on that i know web development i am familiar with python i am familiar with basic linux like how linux is working right and how ci cd environments work so that was my entire knowledge base and based on that i picked up a project called uh, developing a pg web te- a testing harness for the official postgres website right so that is how i picked the project as far as selecting postgres was concerned uh, when i was like trying to pick up the organizations postgres was one f- f- familiar name for me so i just picked it up Uh, to see okay what projects are there and i stumbled upon upon the testing harness project right and the same story goes for 2024 uh, like last uh, i came across uh, this project called pg watch 3 uh, which is a monitoring tool for postgres 
and i started exploring the code base a little bit got in touch with a mentor and then we came up with a proposal like this was uh, like this time uh, like we listed the project ourselves and then uh, i was able to participate i guess that has been an uh, incredible journey by continuing uh, google summer of code at the same organization because um, yeah yeah okay so one more thing when it comes to contributing to same organization right since there will be some mm-hmm. kind of month delay uh were you in yeah. touch with the organization in terms of contribution or was it just via emailing thing yeah i was in touch with the organization so what happened is uh, in august uh, when google summer of code wrapped up like i was like i actually loved the infosys community i wanted to do more so at that time my case came across uh, these things called extensions so postgres uh, like it's a solid database and you can also extend its capabilities right so you have a framework called pgrx which is written in rust right so using that framework you can develop some extensions for the database so i started looking into that uh, then there is a company called tembo.io uh, that works uh, in this field only like uh, developing extensions and also um, providing managed cloud services for postgres and i started contributing to that org, uh, to that org right and i just kept a i just stayed involved in the entire in, in for that entire gap and after that like uh, when the gsoft timeline was released i thought that okay this pg watch is sounds awesome let's uh, start working on this okay so now that google summer of code 2024 has ended successfully many people are looking for applying into google summer of code 2025 so do you have any road map that a student needs to follow who is just starting off his career in or uh, any field it can be development ti or so on what will be your thoughts okay so like before going on to a supposed road map like there are some points that i want to mention regarding google summer of code okay so like the trend that i have seen is that people only want to participate in this program because at the end they don't they want to get a job like it's a good thing like that is why you are participating in these programs right to uh, to improve your cv get more experience right but just getting a job should not be your end, end, end goal like your goal should be like to actually explore the technology uh, technologies that are out there see how people are working because the experience that those people have in those organizations is far more valuable than anything you can ever get in your entire career they have been working in that particular field for around 20 to 30 years right and they are sort of uh, the like we go to people to interact to and by google summer of code you get that chance so like this should be a mindset when applying for the program right so as far as a road map is concerned like there are some obvious steps like you need to stay up to date with the timeline that okay when is the road map when is the entire timeline being rolled out you need to sort your priorities also that you don't have any other thing that overlaps google summer of code because you need to give your time in that right so after those things are sorted out or uh, comes uh, we come to the uh, application process right so at that time the thing that i found most helpful for me when selecting an organization was that uh, i did not try to opt uh, to select organizations that i had no idea about right because like this tra- this study might work for some people that they can just select a random organization and see the projects right but like there are so many organizations it becomes a difficult task so for me like uh, if you are aware with of uh, aware of some open source software that you have used in the past okay or you were interested in that like okay i have seen this thing being used like uh, and you just want to see what projects are being developed around that so you can start out uh, uh, filtering out the organizations like that of course you should look at the organizations that participated uh, the previous year the list almost remains the same like there are some changes there some organizations don't take part sometimes they are not allowed to take part take part by google also but uh, you need to st- uh, like ha- like you need to first figure out the organization that you want to work in and this is the uh, process that i'll say work the best for me okay second is selecting a project so when selecting a project uh, there are some factors that you keep, need to keep in mind first is that uh, when you're applying your uh, you should be aware of what you know okay like you should be aware of what uh, what tech uh, what technologies you know what technologies you can understand right and after that uh, when you uh, go through the projects the second step should be to see is uh, should be that you should see that okay if what new will I, uh, not uh, like what is the new thing that i'll be learning from doing that project right so 
a combination of these two uh, can help you decide a uh, decide which project will be the best for you all right uh, yeah. so moving on with the google summer of code itself one of the major thing when it comes to applying is proposal because this is where many people get stuck and i mean in my opinion from the previous two experience that i had with google summer of code i spent too much of time in preparing proposal rather than uh, the other things because when it comes in the yeah. final one week of time i see people contributing to new projects which is unnecessary yeah. stuff that they are trying to do yeah. because uh, what from my experience what i've seen is if there is any organization right you have a project so what i've seen people doing is they have replicated the same project in their resume and they have tried to do something similar so this is good i'm not telling this is a wrong thing uh, but trying this in the last week of when you are supposed to apply it's probably one of uh, not the ideal way because there are other factors as well uh, it can be the open source contributions that you have done to that organization if not the open source uh, contribution or pr that you have done to other organizations as well and then again yeah. uh, i'm pretty sure some way your previous experience in any internship also matters if not uh, having a solid project also works so how do you actually structure a proposal uh, and what are the key points or key keywords that everyone needs to mention mm-hmm. which makes their proposal uh, in a very good way that can be selected so what are your thoughts on preparing a proposal okay so uh... i share my experience in this uh, regarding this so when i applied to google summer of code uh, for the first time in 2023 uh, my process was a little different i had contributed to postgres before that uh, i had a i had a, a, a project similar to the testing harness that i had developed in my first year like although at the end of uh, that particular google summer of code i realized that the two projects were very different from each other but i had that experience uh, from from the starting and uh, when i was drafting my proposal i mentioned that okay i have worked in this similar field uh, in this in, in a project similar to this there are some things that you guys uh, that are lacking in your proposal uh, that are lacking in your requirements and there are some things that uh, i have developed uh, that can probably help help the project out in a better way so i drafted my proposal according to that i listed the i listed the entire architecture then i provided the link for my previous project uh, re- like constantly referring it back and forth uh, as i was writing the technical details and then i shared it with uh, uh, with the assigned mentor at the time so uh, once i shared my proposal they pointed out some mistakes uh, uh, they also pointed out some uh, flaw uh, some improvements that can be that could have been made to the flow and then we like uh, communicated on this back and forth and then at at last we had a final proposal for this which i submitted so the key points while designing a proposal is that first try to understand the project yourself okay note down the key points that you have understood draft a demo proposal for that don't just try to replicate any replicate any other proposal just draft a demo proposal first share it with the mentor or the organization admin like whoever is responsible for that particular project in my case th- those are the same people so uh, i so do that uh, take their feedback on your proposal uh, do this con- and once you and together you can uh, get to a f- proposal that is actually fit for the project yeah so that's it awesome uh, so i would also like to share my own experience as well uh, so what i did during uh, my google summer of code 2024 was i saw a project uh, from the organization of red and lab and i had built similar project on those same lines so the project was about uh, building multilingual llm and you are supposed to fine tune a base model so i have already have experience in nlp where i fine tuned uh, llama models mistral models so i wrote a mail to them and i said that uh, hey this description is nice and i would like to add the evaluation for it and how we can improve the performance of uh, fine tuning model and later if you want to give that fine tune models to the end users or anyone who wants to use it we can also integrate a chatbot where you can build something called as retrieval augmented generation so i gave this proposal to them and uh, they enjoyed it and then we had few follow up questions and few follow up calls before even applying for google summer of code and once i was able to get that clarity on what red and lab were looking for from that particular project 
I knew what I was supposed to write in the proposal and then started uh, the time when you are supposed to submit your proposal. During this time, I again mailed them saying that, hey, can you send me a referral uh, proposal so that I can apply for Google Summer of Code? And also, if you can mention a few key points on what I need to include, it will be great. And they actually sent me a template where I need to apply for Google Summer of Code, how it needs to be, and few reference proposal from the past year. And that probably helped. And one thing what you need to take uh, back from this conversation is communication is the key. If you know your mentors well, as Akshat also mentioned, he was uh, in connect with the mentors, two of the mentors that uh, were guiding him for Google Summer of Code. So he was in con constant touch with them. He was sharing what his process was, whatever doubts he had regarding the project. This way, if you are already communicating with your mentors, even before Google Summer of Code, you will probably have very high chances compared to those or just submitting the proposal. So yeah, these are few tricks and tips that everyone can apply. It can be communication with your mentors. Secondly, it can be a reference project. As Akshat also didn't contribute to Postgres before, even I didn't contribute to Red Lab before. But if you look at the common thing that we have, we contributed a similar project which the organization was looking for. And that way we knew what they are trying to do and we were better candidate than other. So yeah, this is few things that you can do when you have to apply for your proposal, have similar projects, then have few contributions as well. And then uh, if you know what project you're doing, writing the timeline of project is the key thing that you can do as well, because that's the very important part. How well yeah. your timeline is, what you will do in week one, what you'll do in week two, week three, week four, till week eight. Probably it will be six or eight weeks. So if you have that clarity, yeah. even mentors will know, okay, he knows what this project is about. So project timeline, again, is very important. So now that you have AI, right? Even this channel is AI with Tarun. You just have to write good prompts and you have plot.ai, you have GPT, who can guide you in this process as well. So learn prompt engineering. Cool. So as I already mentioned about, we shared similar things. We shared few similar things in Google Summer of Code as well. Let's move out of open source now and let's talk about how do we get the exposure of tech. One thing uh, what I've noticed in my previous talks as well, people ask me, hey, Baya, what programming language should I start with? And it's quite overwhelming because there are so many programming languages. There are so many fields that people are exploring. And now that you have AI, you are not quite sure which field you are supposed to explore. And this is where if again, if I have to share a few similar thoughts we had uh, in our career as well, Akshat did mobile development, game development, then database management. Even I had something similar, IoT, hardware, image processing, computer vision. So we were not sure of what was our exact field that we need to get into. So we explored everything, we found our interest, and that's where we started doing what we wanted. So what would you say to someone who is feeling overwhelmed with the options in tech? Right. So technology will keep on evolving. Uh, and in my opinion, the best thing that we can do is stick to the basics. Right? We should, uh, like, like, our focus should not only be on learning, like, X number of programming languages, X number of frameworks, X number of this and that. Uh, after our focus should be on understanding how problems are actually solved. Okay, how software is actually built. Okay, how uh, software is actually built, right? So, as far as my experience has been concerned in this, I started off with Java in school, like Operating Standard uh, in ICC board. So, I started off with that, uh, and I slowly started to exploring uh, things on the side uh, in school also. Like I started playing around with the Swing and FX frameworks in Java. And I developed some games in the beginning, like ping pong and everything, like just to have fun, right? So I think that component of just having fun while doing it was the one that uh, contributed uh, to learning uh, everything that I've learned right now. So yeah, moving on, uh, probably we are talking too much of on tech and there are so many things that one can explore in technology as well. As long as you are having fun, as long as you know what you're doing, that's all that matters. And once you figure it out, right, once you know what you're trying to do, the roadmap will be clear to you as well. You don't have to go to Google or go to ChatGPT. Hey, I finished database. Can I know what should I do next? You yourself will have the clarity. You don't need any tutorial or any resources. 
The only thing that you need is documentation. That's it. A clear cut documentation. Yep. If you have of any tool that you are working on, that will motivate you. Okay, this document is huge. There are so many features. These people are building, and I want to try them. If you have that kind of energy, if you have that kind of enthusiasm, you'll do great. Uh, so that's one thing that you can take away from technology as well. Now, now that we know there are so many fields that everyone can explore. Um, there are so many. You don't have to name it, right? Uh, there are so many things what people want to do. One thing hmm. is people are not sure of how do we get internship, how do we connect to people, where are these networking events happening. If you are from Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai, you have so many meetup. But what if you are not from these areas? What are the communities that you can be part of so that you are up to date with the technology that is happening around? Like this was a similar situation for me. Uh, like at my university, we have. Uh, technical clubs uh, we have a lot of technical clubs but the scope in which they operate is a little limited so for me personally open source was my escape from all of that uh, i started uh, when i first started out with google summer of code and got involved with the postgres community uh, like when i got involved with the postgres community uh, i have spent most of my time like just interacting on the mailing lists and trying to suggest some more alternatives uh, in terms of uh, the project that i was working on uh, during My, during Google Summer of Code, so to actually uh, connect with people, I think one of the best ways is to pick an open source project that you like. Start uh, like you don't even even need to contribute to it uh, that much. You can just if you are, you can just go through the uh, try to use that tool, raise some questions. You can uh, raise some questions on their official repositories, learn more about it, and then act, then maybe you can raise a raise a pull request or two, right? So that is how I'll say is you can actually get uh, some more exposure with technical communities. So one of the things uh, that I found really helpful was like like when you actually start or you don't know anything, right? Like which communities to join, which actual like which platform to use to interact with people. So I was really active on Discord at that time. So uh, I saw that Rust uh, Rust had a chat had a Discord channel. So I just jumped into that uh, particular channel and I started to explore all the uh, like all the Sub pages that they had, like they had some projects related to operating systems. They had some projects related to databases, like implementing the basics of databases. Right? There were some pro projects with in networking. So I started to looking. I started just looking around in those Discord channels and seeing, okay, what people are doing. Okay, what is the <clears throat> like? What are the actual things that uh, matter when you are building a project? So those things are like. In, uh, like when I started to see those projects, I also had some questions that okay, how how are these people doing this X thing themselves, right? So I just directly uh, uh, wrote a DM to them, and they were kind of to reply. So that is how like I started interacting with people. And right now I'm using Twitter a lot. Like it is also an amazing place to connect with pe connect with uh, people, especially in tech. My bad, right? Like the Indian Twitter space is like really awesome, especially the community around uh, Arpit Bhani. Like that is a pretty awesome community. So, like these are the places you can ex. Uh, these are the platforms that you can go to to just in interact with people. One of the things that you can try out if you don't know anything is just pick up anything, uh, pick up any software you know, see if it has a community around it, and just join it. And from that, uh, you'll get an idea of how to actually uh, get involved. Uh, I totally agree with Discord as well. Uh, we also have our Discord channel. Probably you can join those. Uh, Now, one thing about Discord is even I started off the community thing from Discord, mm -hmm. but slowly I moved on with the in-person thing because I had that luxury being in Bangalore. But obviously, there are uh, other places as well where you can try to connect with people who are actually doing a good job. Um, open source probably is the best thing ever that has happened uh, to people who want to explore opportunities. Because just contributing is not just one door. You have networking. You have collaboration that you can do. And if you know this path properly, then Discord, Twitter, all these spaces are one of the best places that you can be. And one more thing, uh, this might be funny, but Reddit comments are also one of the good things, right? Because if yeah, you are, yeah. <laughs> because if you are yeah. quite involved on Reddit, right? There are few moderate uh, tools. It can be. I'll tell from my experience. There is local llama. Okay, so more than question, you will find more people on Reddit comments, and if you are a common commenter to their moderator or any uh, program, they will know. Okay, this guy will come and he'll comment, and you will stay in touch with those people. And 
when it comes to reddit comments right you will probably gain more knowledge and you will get mature comments you will get mature yeah. feedback if you have this kind of feedback definitely you'll improve this is from my experience which i have i've done in my past as well cool so reddit is an awesome place reddit yeah reddit no doubt it's one of the best places <laughs> that i hang out uh, yeah. i probably have lot of yeah. of course as well uh long back when i started okay. anime view uh it mm-hmm. was on website mm-hmm. i used to code and used to watch anime mm-hmm. i used to club both of them and i used to write blog articles so when you write okay. any content probably reddit was a place where you get matured feedbacks and you'll also get yeah. few people will give you right and left feedback you <laughs> don't care whether it is right or wrong they'll probably just yeah. see what mm-hmm. is the outcome of it if the outcome is not good probably they'll bash mm-hmm. it properly if the output is good they'll encourage mm-hmm. to share the details as well so that is what mm-hmm. reddit does and if you look at twitter you have few friends mm-hmm. so they'll just comment hey thanks for sharing linkedin mm-hmm. probably i don't even mention linkedin because that's one place linkedin that is going on place uh, discord discord also there are people who encourage you sometimes you don't need people yeah. to encourage you. you also need people who discourage who demotivate you and the p- place where you will feel discouraged yeah. and demotivated is not linkedin rather it's reddit you should go check out reddit comments and you should also go and comment if you know some topic okay this is a good topic i want to comment on it and once you get any comment and if you have replies if you can give a reply back to them that's when you are matured enough okay now i can also talk in tech so that's one experience that everyone needs to face as well so ever since i became google developer expert there were so many talks that i have given uh, probably it was malaysia that is included it can be nepal kathmandu and all one thing what i faced is most of the audience were above my age and i have faced one feedback saying that hey don't you have any public speaking fear how can you talk so confidently so this is where when it comes to conferences uh, many people want to talk but they don't deliver it because of that stage fear or public speaking skill and in your case uh, you have given a european conference uh, probably at a very young age being a student so how was your experience how was your first international talk experience yeah uh, so it was not only my first international talk like this was the first technical talk that i ever gave at a conference <laughs> okay, okay so uh, that's awesome i guess that's even more impressive right because giving a first talk thanks. and the first talk itself is an international talk which is not within asia and it's outside asia as well so what was your preparation like uh, probably you can walk us through your preparation so i was pretty nervous that okay what am i supposed to tell these people like they have around 15 to 20 years of experience and what is like what is that i can contribute in this conference that can actually like make it worth their while right so i was lucky enough that my mentors were there to help me out during the entire process like right from when i applied to the conference they were the ones who suggested that i should uh, apply for that particular conference and uh, once uh, the proposal got accepted which was also a surprise for me <laughs> right so uh, after that uh, i started preparing the slides uh, and again the same process that went in preparing the proposal uh, i just uh, like got the feedback from our mentors like we just had a lot of back and forth this is just some changes i added some uh, some my five cents to that uh, presentation and like this that uh, like this like i had the entire content prepared but again like public speaking is a little tough uh, when it's like it's your first first time right so had that uh, like in that part, during that particular conference uh, like i just had a lot of uh, practice sessions before that with my mentors they had, they like uh, we connected over google meet and we just had some demo runs for the presentations and with that we were actually able to uh, like i was actually able to get over the fear so like it's all about just practicing the thing and staying true to your content like just not saying anything at at that particular stage true true so i guess even i had something similar uh, face as well like when i was delivering my first talk i was quite nervous but since the topic was something that i was working on for quite some time like it was on retrieval augmented generation before that i also had few talks on tensorflow where i gave workshop but workshop and public speaking were two different things when i was giving workshop most of the people who were in the audience were my friends i knew who they are they knew who i am but when it comes to event and when it is a conference it's completely different story 
you don't know who the audience are and one major thing about events are you get both kind of audience who are completely new and on the other hand you will have someone who is definitely better than you so managing both of them in the similar talk that was something that it in my mind how will i manage both this kind of experience people so i spoke to few of them uh, i spoke to my mentors uh, mentors in the sense where i work um, and i also spoke to few of my friends who were already speakers at conference and i guess this kind of communication again helps so as we said earlier communication is one of the best key if you want to crack anything whether it is google summer of code whether it is remote job internship anything if you want this kind of opportunity just communicate and you don't have to fear right because it's just an email it's just a linkedin message but one thing what you shouldn't do is just randomly sending a message because i've seen so many random message people they don't do cold emailing they just ask for something that they need uh one thing is you shouldn't always cast people on what you need rather you should carry the conversation in such a way that you want to impact someone who is not the other person who you are sending the email rather you are targeting a very large audience so if your email is written in such a way even you will get the reply back if you randomly send hey i want to apply to google summer of code can you help me out no one will reply to you right why will i yeah. spend my time helping you who i don't even know but rather if you frame your email such a way that you already have some experience and there is something that you are looking for that you want to discuss so once you point out that you need to discuss something probably someone will be interested to talk with you if you directly tell that hey i want to get an internship i want to earn money no one will reply so how do you actually cold email what are your tips when you email someone yeah, like uh actually before send like as you said like you shouldn't just send out random messages right so my approach usually is that okay i i first see like okay what that particular person is doing okay i try to see what their experience has been i try to see how it is related to what i am trying to achieve right and most of my content is tailored around around that so like like it you should not put in like that much effort in writing an e- email so that like it should not sound artificial right it should sound just like you know normally converse with people that's so a that is point. what my uh, that's again one yeah. of the good point because i have seen few uh, keywords that gpt uh, yeah. <laughs> dwell into realm this kind of yeah. words is very easily be recognizable so if again i see yeah, i have done that too also i i did that for a few <laughs> when i was in my first year of college and i realized okay you are just screwing the screwing this up totally yeah uh, that's a good point that's a good point yeah yeah so like that's it about like just try to keep it a natural try to be actually interested in what the person is doing like just not taking what you want right okay so now that we spoke about public speaking right we know there are few people who wants to speak but they're not able to deliver but let's look a other way around where there are already folks who are doing good they're speaking but they're not getting the opportunity to speak uh, they're just going to some random meet up they are giving talks over there but how do they get big like conferences again as you said right it's one of the best way for a speaker to demonstrate his skill but where do you yeah. find these conferences what are the opportunity where do you apply yeah so luckily for me uh, poses has a calendar for conferences so they just they have it pub- they have it published it Uh, on the web on the website and you can keep track that okay at what time this particular conference is happening and then you can tailor your talk around around that time right you can apply to the to those conferences one of the like in the beginning like i was really lucky that my first talk got accepted but uh, most of the times like uh, the first talk that you will send out will most probably get rejected like after that talk also mm-hmm. i applied to some other conferences as well Uh, those proposals were rejected right but uh, the point is the point to keep is that to keep your in your mind is that you just need to keep on applying like the same thing with jobs you just need to keep on applying learn from the mistakes uh, that like in case of conferences there is a very beautiful thing you can actually reach out to the uh, organizer organizer of the selection committee and ask them like what was lacking in this how can i improve this particular uh, abstract or talk so like that is the way you can apply to various conferences on your own yeah that's it for me so, so how was your europe trip i'm sure that there might be some uh, very weird experience that you might have tackled it can be in terms of visa approval uh, it can be flight delays it can be anything right uh, so what was your moment key moment of your europe trip 
yeah so for me the key like there were a lot of amazing moments uh, but the main key moment that started before uh, that i had was uh, during my visa application process also so like this was the first time when i was applying for a visa i didn't have a single clue so i had i had like a stack of documents that i took uh, took to the visa center right so i like and i returned with that stack home like <laughs> only a few documents were required so that was a weird incident after that uh, like uh, when since this was my first international trip like it was uh, a little different to actually uh, you know uh, to actually go through that in- immigration process and everything so yeah so those were some of the key moments of the trip like so how long was the conference yeah uh, so uh, the conference was for 3 days uh, and i stayed a uh, day longer uh, there just to uh, see explore the city right uh, so for like the conference was pretty amazing uh, one one of the things that i learned at that conference was that uh, like wherever you are from the entire world uh, you just need to like you just need to have the uh, like what i'll say is the drive to just keep on learning right because if you have that drive you will actually uh, you'll actually go like if you are presented with such opportunities you can actually utilize them to understand uh, to understand what your direction should be in life Right. so that is one of the key takeaways from the conference like i got to meet so many uh, contributors uh, uh, that have been like that have been part of that entire ecosystem for around 20 to 30 years i got to interact with them face to face so that was one of the uh, amazing moments for me there like i also came across some people uh, like there were a lot of indians in the conference as well right some uh, some uh, so it was a good experience overall Uh, I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, probably conferences are one place that also show you your level. Okay, there are so many things that you. Yeah. Uh, once you know that level, right? There is so much that I need to learn. That drive is something uh, you and I try to achieve. So one more thing about conferences, which I really enjoyed a lot, is the people are so curious to know your story as well. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. One thing is, even though you see any experienced folk, right, who is at forty, fifty. He'll be so curious to know, hey, how did you end up here? What are your uh, yeah. experience? So that curiosity is something again, which is good to see because most of the time, what happens is I feel if you are forty, fifty, probably won't be that much interested in how someone yeah. else is matter. But at these conferences, probably especially outside India, I've seen many people who are so curious to know what you have done, and they're so. happy that okay it's good to see you so that feeling again is a very great experience to have in conferences so moving on so one major thing about uh, being a student and doing multiple things is managing time because i have my own experience probably you have your own experience as well uh, we can share both of it but i also want to know being a student uh, you were part of your college work there was open uh, source thing and also there were community so there are multiple things one needs to manage and one of the major thing as a student what they need to master rather than programming and technology is the other skills that you have communication we already spoke a lot there is one more thing apart from communication and that is time management so what are your ways to manage time and how do you actually have this balance between your college life and your professional life yeah uh, so talking about time management like personally like i think it's a matter of your priorities like what are like what is what are your end goals and what are your current priorities right it can be some someone can have like they have their health on top family second and third work right that is the case for me so like based on these prior priorities you can actually chart out how you plan your days days or even years right so uh, this is a uh, i think that i find uh, really helpful because once you know what you want to do once you have that clarity right that really helps you in organizing uh, what activity you have to do at what time so like there are some people that say that okay you work for uh, you like you can you study for 3 hours then you uh, do this for 4 hours then you do this for x number of hours like that that is just too mono, uh, like it's just too artificial right it should be a product of your own uh, motives so that is my strategy behind managing time cool uh, yeah so i'll also share uh, one of my trick that i usually use for time management so as uh, akshat told about priority i do something similar but in a different way 
So there is a book called Eat Your Frog. I am not sure if you have heard about it. Okay. So there is a chapter in Eat Your Frog. So there is a rule called A, B, C, D, E. So what this A, B, C, D, E rule does is whatever you need to do in that particular day, add it as a A. So this task, no matter what happens, you need to complete this and you need to sleep. It can be smallest thing that you want to do. Suppose if you want to put a LinkedIn post today, if you want to send email to someone, this can be your real task. You don't have to feel uh, discomfort saying that, hey, this is a very small task and I'm keeping it at A. So you should never do that. If there is any task that you want to do, just add that to the A so that whenever you're starting off your day, that task needs to be completed. And then you have B. B task is less priority compared to A. And this is where I usually put my coding related task because we know that if you end up into bug, that won't be solved in that particular day. It might go for a week, yeah. it might go for a three days. This is something which is undeterministic and you don't have any time limit when you will be solving that. So I keep B as task when there is something related to my work, there is something related to uh, what I'm doing in coding. And when you're a student, probably B can be your college life, right? So right. in my case, since I graduated last year, B now is my uh, professional life where anything that is related to my work, I put that to B. If there is anything that is related to my work, that comes to the B. Now comes to the C. C is something that takes three to four days of time to complete the task. Like for example, uh, you are working on some kind of project. Project, every time there needs to be certain deadline. If there is no deadline, you don't feel the drive of completing something. So whenever deadlines are your major priority, those tasks will come into C. So now that you have A, which is your top priority to complete in that particular day itself, B, it is less priority, which you can complete it. And it's an undeterministic thing, which can take some time as well. C, it is something that needs to be completed within deadline. D, it's something that you can delegate it to someone. Uh, suppose if you have mentors around you, if you have friends around you, and if you think they can do your task or they can do any small task, right? Uh, task can be anything. So if we are coding, there might be certain things which you are leaving behind. And if you think someone else can do it for you, then this task, you can delegate it to someone. And here, what I'm doing is, uh, I have few friends who can delegate my task, whether it is related to editing, uh, creating reels for my YouTube channel or um, even uh, Instagram page. So when it comes to delegation, I keep those tasks in D and then you have E. So what E does is if there is any task that you need to do, but it's not that top priority, just eliminate. So this ABCD rule has worked a lot for me. Uh, probably it's been around one year. I'm following this rule and it's a great, great trick that anyone can use. And based on that, I just experiment different things on how I can keep my task that is in priority list. And I make sure that it is completed uh, rather than it's getting delayed. So yeah, that's one approach as well. And time management, it depends on how well you can prioritize things. And yeah, yeah. About time management. So everyone can have their own versions in this, right? Like, like you mentioned the Pomodoro technique for me, that does not work at all. Like I need a dedicated hour to actually get a thing and get a, a task done. Right. So exactly, it, it yeah. depends from person to person. Yeah. yeah, I agree with it as well. Uh, so Pomodoro technique, usually what happens is even if we spend 50 minutes, right? It's hardly that mm -hmm. anyone will spend that 50 minutes. Some people might procrastinate, they'll take their phone, they'll watch something. So yeah. how do you manage that 50 minutes? Again, is a very big task to follow. Yeah. So that's where Eisen over matrix is there. There are other uh, ways people can do, but yeah, as you said, it differs person to person. Uh, all right. So moving on with the next question, we are in a phase where AI has been at peak. There are so many tools. You have agentic workflows like you might have seen Devin AI recently open AI released their O1, which can reason yeah, yeah. by taking time. And just two days back, they released something called a speech to speech, where you are yeah. actually talking to certain someone, right? So in this particular era where AI is taking uh, your reality into actual thing, we were just dreaming these things. Now it's a reality. Yeah. So how do you think it's going to affect the freshers? Because now that you are in your final year, right? You might see those kind of fear between your colleagues. 
it can be your placement cell, uh, your HR officers of any college that you're working on. They have that kind of, um, what do you call, fear that, okay, how will my students will be placed at so-and-so company? So how is the environment currently? How are the placements going on in your colleges? Yeah, uh, so uh, this particular wave of uh, like uh, LMs and agents has like it has affected everything. Like it has changed the way we work a lot. Uh, we work uh, as students, right? Uh, but uh, and it has definitely affected the way placements and everything are uh, going on right now, right? Uh, uh, there has been a massive change in how companies are conducting interviews, and it, there is a there is a, you can see the change on ground. Right, uh, when you are in that particular situation, it is pretty visible. So, like apart from that, like a thing that I'd like to mention here is that uh, I've seen that people are relying too much on agents right now. Right, they are just saying that okay, it, like I I have this LM, I'll just get it to do everything that I have to do. Right, I think that should not be the mindset. Uh, when you are, uh, you should actually see them as similar tools. Like there was a time when you didn't have even code sy syntax highlighting in your editors. Right. That came like it's not a, a change like a lens, right? But it's it was a nice small feature that added to the pro the productivity of the developers, right? So now, if we have these tools, uh, these uh, these awesome tools that can uh, generate uh, some really awesome uh, or some really awesome uh, th awesome things, right? So you can actually you should actually try to use them to enhance your uh, the way you work, like the way you study. So for example, earlier uh, when so let's say you want to uh, study out a particular topic, right? Earlier, you'll try to find a summary for that topic. You'll see, okay, th th there are like X and Y things within this topic that I can focus upon, right? Now you can just get an LM to do that, like just do the meta, just get, give it the metadata. And based on that, you can strategize that. How do you want to learn that particular thing? Okay, so what will, you, will be your next steps? So this is how we should use uh, this particular technology, like to actually boost the rate at which you learn. Bachelor. Like it should not be that the technology is doing everything, right? It should be, uh, it is there to help you and you should use it in that way. Yeah, nice perspective. Uh, one more thing that I like to add over here is, so recently whenever, uh, since I'm from a AI startup, we have built multiple POCs. It can be proof of concept. So when we build this kind of projects, right, we are using LLM calls. One thing that we have noticed is human in a loop always works. Because if you know where things are going wrong, I'll give you an example. We wrote a prompt, which was very big prompt, and we got a very good result. But there was one paragraph which didn't make sense. So now we knew how to tweak that. So if you know yeah. how to tweak certain things within your results that is getting generated, probably it will place you in a very good shape. Or if you understand how these systems are built, you will know, okay, where you need to go and tweak. If you know how to tweak this mechanism process, whether it is on the code side or whether it is on the proposal side, because when we are talking about jobs, there is also non-technical background where people are writing blog articles, they are creating proposal campaigns and all those things. In campaigns, as well, I'll probably speak on both the sides, whether it is technical or non-technical. On non-technical side, whenever you write campaigning programs, there are few proposal which doesn't even make sense. So this is where people actually want to learn how to write prompts because there are so many ways, right? Uh, you might have seen O1. O1 is very good in generating step-by-step -step reasoning. But in campaigning, yeah. if you actually provide a right context with number of examples, probably you'll get better result. But if you don't know what kind of context to pass, how will you even get the result? So this domain specific yeah. knowledge, you will only gain when you have done something. And in order to do something, you have to start something. So if you are a fresher, yeah. if you are feeling demotivated, just start something, gain a bit of experience where you can have that clarity check that, okay, I can become a domain expert. If you are a domain expert, and if you can use, as Akshat said, use these tools to leverage yourself. If you can do this, both the things, probably you don't have to fear. And jobs, I don't think it will be taken uh, probably in the next two three years. We are in the level three of what uh, Sam Altman is saying, the intelligence age. There was a nice article that he wrote on September 23rd. Uh, the blog article is the intelligence age, where he talks about where the AI will go. And there are so many people who are talking about AGI as well. But I feel it's still too early. There are so many improvements that needs to be done. 
there is so many uh, feedback mechanism that needs to be improved and it might take time yeah. and in order to improve this feedback mechanism you need humans to do that you need humans yeah. to give you feedback yeah like engineering is not just about opening your text editor and writing code right it's about designing a process think iterating over it okay and i don't think that is like at this point it's not possible to actually uh, replicate that level of intelligence or consciousness also yeah uh, some way i'll also agree there are different perspective but we can't defend every perspective as well uh, yeah, yeah. you have any closing thoughts uh, we probably had a very good discussion on open source um, remote opportunities communities it can be work life balance conference and all so how do you want a student to start off their first year what they need to focus and what should be their starting step once they get into engineering yeah so like my like my simple advice would be just like this has been my uh, like you can say mantra for the entire duration till now like just do it that nike 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 caption right just do it so that is that is the entire mantra just pick up things that you enjoy it can be related to programming engineering it can be something else also just pick those things explore like exploring is the key portion if you don't explore you'll never know cool yeah so it no doubt uh, there are so many ways you can explore but there are some part people when we say right ai won't replace your job hmm. there are few jobs which can be replaced so if you are someone in that arena like if you want to be a copywriter if you want to just write blog articles if that is your focus probably you need to come up and you need to explore more and yeah. also i have a rational thought on now uh, front end engineers if you are only focused on front end probably you need to learn a bit more you need to have a bit yeah. of understanding on back end as well because what i've seen is there are so many multimodals which have come out in this year uh, so multimodal yeah. they are quite advanced their vision is very good if you can okay. just draw something you are able to replicate it using this kind of tools it can be cloud it can be any other thing so uh, yeah uh, as you mentioned that uh, like uh, there is this statement right that we all have heard like uh, jack of all trades master of none right but better than master of one so that is also one thing you should remember that if you are only foc- like as you said if you are only focused on things that can actually be replaced that won't benefit you in the long run you need to have the entire picture and that is where like exploring various fields helps you out just get that just that essence of engineering exactly right that so yeah uh, i guess it's been a quite a long time uh, thank you again akshat for taking out <laughs> time and discussing your journey with us obviously since we are looking for conferences i hope we get to meet at some conference whether it is in asia india or europe looking forward to our uh, collaboration in future as well thank you again for your time